talk about the fact that wages are rising faster than they have done for 11 years, but leading think tank says living standards are still falling for many households, which talks about what you were saying yeah. earlier. It's sort Just of confusing statistics. Yeah, contradicting yeah. data. I know, because it sounds like things are going brilliantly if you yeah. hear wages are rising faster than they have for 11 years. But this research that also has come out at the same time is about our disposable income. So it's what you have left mm. after you've paid out your taxes, uh, you know, your household costs, things like that, any benefits you receive. So the Resolution Foundation, which is a think tank, look into all of this to work out whether life's actually getting any better for us. And what they found is that overall income over the last two years has actually fallen. So even though we're talking about wages going up, it's when you take everything into account, it, disposable incomes for households have actually fallen. So why? Well, it's a, a couple of reasons, but one of the main things is to do, what, do with how much work we're actually doing. So what's called, you know, productivity. We always hear that word mainly bandied around by politicians saying we need to improve our productivity. And we haven't done that. So we're, we're working hard, but we're not necessarily making as much as we're used to. And the Resolution Foundation have explained why. Typically for... Um for a country and for households, the way we get richer is not necessarily just by going out and working more hours, although we do do a bit of that, it's by working smarter. It's by generating more output for every hour that we work. You know, that's by investing in machines that help us to work smarter. That's by having new management structures that help us perform better. And all the way through to the financial crisis for decades and decades and decades, about two thirds of the growth we had as a country was coming from that increase in productivity. Since the financial crisis, the very famous productivity puzzle, that's pretty much ground to a halt. So we've no longer had that as an engine of growth. So instead what we've done is we've just worked harder. We've not worked smarter, we've worked harder. But now we're running out of road on that as well. Yeah, so as you were hearing there, to make up for the lost income, we're working longer hours. Mm. So if you look at the actual figures on it, on average it's around 32 hours per week. and. And the reason why that's interesting is because over the century, normally about every four years, it tends to go down by an hour, how, how often we work each week. Uh, so it tends to go down, but it actually hasn't been. Um, and so what it means is we're doing a lot more work, but we're actually not getting more money for it. So we're earning the same money for it when you look at the, the income level. And um, so that's why there is this issue of households just not feeling any better for it um, and putting pressure on people, which is the point the Resolution Foundation are making. Despite wages going up, which is great news in one sense, there is so much pressure still on mm -hmm. households. So they might not feel better off. Quite frustrating, that, isn't it? Yeah. Working it is, longer, yeah. working harder, not feeling it. Yeah. OK, we'll have happier news <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> later on, shall we? Why not? I can Why always not? dance if you know, you could. Or, well. you know what, or we could talk about golf, because I think yeah. we're given an update on how they're recovering from the cyber attacks back in 2015. Steph has been taking a little look. What they said, Steph? Yeah, it was, a, it was a really big deal back then. Mm -hmm. There's been lots of analysis over the last few years about whether they you know, can actually turn things around again. So let me give you the results. Morning, everyone. Yeah, Talk Talk, just to remind you, has around 4 million customers, provides telecom uh, communication services like mobiles and broadband and, you know, all this, don't you? In 2015, the company was uh, hacked and hundreds of thousands of customer details were stolen. Uh, the data breach cost the company around 80 million pounds and to be honest it's been picking up the pieces ever since so today the latest results are out we're going to find out from telecoms expert matthew howitt uh, what he makes of all and, and what those results are good morning to you matthew um Hi, give us a flavor then of what we've heard this morning I think, to be honest, it's quite a solid set of results, actually. As you say, TalkTalk Talk has had quite a tough couple of years, particularly since that cyber attack. But things seem to be going in the right direction for them. They've had a bit of a turnaround recently. They've moved their headquarters out of London and moved that to Salford. There's a lot of costs associated with that, which uh, will impact their profitability. But things are looking like they're going in the right direction. Yeah. And I think, crucially, they're adding new broadband customers, which is the, the main metric that we're sort of watching uh, when we think of TalkTalk. Talk. Yeah. Yeah, because interesting, I was just about to say to you, do you think the customer trust is back? Because they did lose quite a few customers, didn't they, when this all happened? They did. I think some people decided that they couldn't trust them anymore and they walked away. Um, a lot of customers, I think, though, that still did get affected by that data breach decided to stay because they offered them quite a good deal. And it seems like more of those customers are starting to come back. We've seen uh, a big rise in the number of new customers, 118,000 in that last quarter. Uh, and in Quite um, positively, a lot of those are taking their faster broadband products, the fibre products that uh, most of the big providers are now trying to get us to switch to. So how is it doing compared to its rivals then? 
I think it's doing quite well. I think Talk Talk has always got to try and work out what it stands for in the market. Is it a big company like BT and Sky that's bundling everything together and trying to sell us all of those things uh, as one? Or is it going to compete um, at the sort of lower end of the market, the sort of more cost conscious customer, which it's always been known for? And I think it's got a bit of a mix of customer base there, particularly given that they're getting those fibre broadband customers on board, which means they can make more profit from them. So I think it's, uh, it's a good story for them compared to how they're are doing. And also with TalkTalk, Talk, they want to build their own network as well, don't they? So tell us a bit more about that. They do, and this was um, a legacy thing coming from, I think, their previous CEO who made a big fight about the amount of fibre that we've got in the ground, which means faster broadband connections. At the moment, companies like TalkTalk Talk are renting their, their fibre broadband connections from um, OpenReach. What they are planning to do is invest a lot of their own money in building fibre right out to the home. They announced that a couple of years ago, but it seems to have hit a bit of a roadblock. They haven't found the £1.5 billion pounds that they needed to do that. And we're, we're still hoping for some kind of announcement about how they're going to do it. We haven't got that yet. So at the moment, they're still relying on that infrastructure from OpenReach. It is a very um, crowded market, isn't it? And you, you would assume that at some point we're going to reach a peak where everyone's got their mobile phone contract and everyone's got their broadband. But is there still growth, do you think, there? I think there is, and crucially, I think there's room to fight for where you sit in that particular market because you've got some customers who are happy to take four or more products from one of the providers and they'll sit happy with that bundle and others are quite keen to shop around and, and pick the best offers from some of the uh, competing providers which have generally meant that we get to pay less for our broadband services um, as, a, as a whole. And I think TalkTalk Talk has got an important role as a challenger as part of that market. It seems to be doing quite well from these results and I suspect that the, the bigger companies will be worried that people are going to flock towards that more uh, cost conscious area of the market. Matthew, lovely to chat to you again, and uh, I know you'll look forward to all the comments you get about your hair every time you come on telly. <laughs> Always a hair-raising analysis from our Matt. Uh, thanks very much, Matt. See you later. See you soon. Analysis. I like that. Indeed. Uh, quick question, random question. Well, yes. It won't be, or will be explained. <laughs> um, your Saturday job when you were a teenager, what did you do? Uh, I worked in a supermarket in the fresh food and frozen section. Did Came you home smelling of sour milk oh, every Saturday. Oh, nothing's changed, really. Beautiful. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> See you later. That's unnecessary. But it's but true. You're bit, he you were stinks. nice to him. You were nice to him for a moment. And he, he just stinks. You just skewered him there. <laughs> what did you do? He knew exactly what he did. Uh, uh, newspaper round, um, school tuck shop. Um... Is school tuck shop a job? What did you do? Hmm. That's more like did a hobby. It, yeah. <laughs> well, no, 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 because we, we would... We would uh... What, did you do, run it? Yeah. Oh, that is an amazing job. That, uh, I tell you what, when we set that school talk shop up, cha-ching. Was this like an entrepreneurial idea yes. for yours as well? There's a little bit of it in me, Steph, because this uh, is what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it is, yeah, sorry, I'm not just randomly But I don't think you were... I don't think I was as entrepreneurial as teenagers are today, but I didn't have the technology. Just they been slightly have. sidetracked. Did you sell refreshers? You know, those yes, big, oh, and um, sherbet dips. Oh, how much were you sharing? Coconut dips boosts. Back then? Five feet. <laughs> Three times over market value. Oh, did you, <laughs> did you do it? I did a bit of McDonald's. Yeah. Worked as a labourer on Saturdays as well. Yeah. And um, I used to make cardboard boxes from flat to actually make them into. Into yeah, so to all, take out somewhere. all of the types of jobs. And I, I, similarly, I worked in a shop. I used to pierce ears and close accessories. Ooh. You were the did last you? person I would want to pierce yeah. my well, I ears. You'd be great, you know, no. having a good old chin wag, putting them at ease, and then. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, you deliver the comfort and then the pain. Yeah, that's actually, a bit like it's my politics, is what you do most days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there is a reason we're talking about this, and that's because there's some research that's come out from Barclays. They've been looking into what the types of jobs uh, young people do now, and they say, actually, it's around half of young people in education uh, work part-time uh, and that's actually less than what it has been in the past so in the past it was around 70 percent of people would uh, young people would have a job that they do part-time and also as we run about the types of jobs are changing too so in the past it would be the, the Saturday jobs the kind of manual labor and, and there are the, those jobs still around but it's also now a lot of online and a lot of entrepreneurial jobs so they're saying something like 670,000 young people who are making money from selling and buying stuff online, which is clever, isn't it? So they're, um, yeah, they're doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. They've got YouTube channels yeah, as exactly. well. Yeah, exactly. So they're, they're really savvy with yeah. kind of sponsored content and stuff like that. Yeah, so they're doing like vlogs or whatever, and then the sponsors will pay them money if they get enough views, and that that's happening too. And, um, and, and it's just interesting how it's changed. And, and if you look at the reasons why, 
first that they say, you know, young people say it gives them more flexibility because they can literally do it on their phone, this type of buying and selling. Um, and also it's about the fact that there just seems to be not as many jobs around as there were, those types of Saturday and part-time jobs. And also when we talk now, there are no jobs for life anymore, yeah. are there? So you've got to have a range of skills and perhaps entrepreneurialism is a more secure way forward yeah. for many. And, and Yeah, and it gives you so many transferable skills, doesn't it? It doesn't matter what job you're doing, it will help you when you go on to do another job, and I think that's what is underappreciated. I listened to somebody on the radio yesterday, Joe Wiley read out a letter from somebody who, uh, really um, serious anxiety, didn't want to leave the home, started an Instagram account called Twins That Travel With Her Sister, and five years on, that's their full-time business now. Oh, wow. And she's been able yeah. to get stories. over her anxiety by travelling in, and that's her full-time yeah, job. Yeah, we are good at being entrepreneurs in this country, yeah. aren't we? Brilliant. I like that about us. Um, Steph, 